Hi, Michael. How are you? G'day, Liz. How are you? I'm all right. That's good. That's good. You're very kind to get up this early. Uh, no problem at all. Um, it's th <laughs> it's three fifty three a.m. <laughs> Dude, you're really nice. I thought it was five. Well, I did too. But anyway, daylight savings and a whole lot of things going on. It's okay. It's all good. I'm I'm up usually not quite this early, but I'm an early bird. But I've got coffee, so good. life's great. Good. Well, I'm sure Ben and Joseph will be on soon. Excellent. Well, so, and you'll just share the screen. Others. Is that the is that the plan? Yes, I will share my screen with you. Uh, oh nope, that's not what I wanted to do. Uh, I believe you can share your screen. Okay. At this point. Okay, share screen. Ah, uh, okay, I see. Yep. Okay. Well, I'll do that when it's when it's time to go. Yeah. No, that's fine. Um, this is the only large Zoom meeting I do, so. Okay. We, uh, I, I gave a, I gave a seminar at UGA a couple of weeks ago, and it, and it worked okay then, so it should be fine today. I'm sure it will be. The new world order, isn't it? Zoom meetings. It is, but it makes these types of things possible, I guess. Well, yeah, I was going to say, you know, like it's, um, I think there is a silver lining, um, you know, the fact that we can tap people from anywhere at any time um, to, to interact. I think it's a, it's a, it's a wonderful thing. Mm -hmm. It really is. So, um, but then teaching is very difficult via Zoom. It's hard. It's hard. Possible, yeah, but hard. Hey, Joe. Good morning. Who is it? I, I can't see who that is. That's Mark. Oh, there you are. Yep, I'm back. I'm going to go away now. <laughs> While you're on, uh, did uh, Ashley talk to you about the Zoom uh, Thursday? Yes, she did. 
and uh, <clears throat> since we both introduced and, and you come up later, I didn't see of any reason for us to, uh, we could be available for questions afterwards, I suppose. Right, now, um, she was, when I talked to her yesterday, she was more or less of the opinion that you had already done an introduction or taped an introduction. That's so part of the, well, we do, it's, and yeah. so did you. Yes. So that's, <laughs> so that's the way, we'll just leave it at that. If okay. that's okay. Yeah, that's good for me. And, and I think Tim's gonna say that we're available for questions or comments afterwards. Okay. We'll see, try to do that. Okay, that's that other news. All right, I'm going away. Hey, Dr. Kimley, how are you? Morning. Good morning. It's a really morning for you. I really appreciate you can get on to this. That's all right. No problem at all. You know, have coffee. It's all good. <laughs> okay. So uh, our associate dean for research is going to do a quick introduction first and before turning to me to introduce you. Okay. Sounds great. Dr. Amick, that's all yours. Thank you. Good morning, everybody, or I guess good afternoon is more appropriate. Um, thank you very much for uh, attending the second public health uh, seminar for the year. This seminar is being uh, offered by the Department of Epidemiology. And I would like to invite Dr. Sue to introduce our presenter. Okay, uh, this is uh, my great pleasure to introduce uh, one of my long-term collaborators and friends, um, uh, Professor Michael Kimley. And so he is right now in Australia, so which is just turned 5 a.m. their time right now. So I really appreciate it. Oh, 4 a.m. Okay, sorry about that. Wow, it's even earlier. So I really, really appreciate he's uh, willing to uh, give a lecture uh, in this hours or this. Um, yeah, and that just like uh, what I told uh, Liz about, this is what the friendship is about, right? So I'm really you know, excited uh, for, uh, for him to uh, share his research with us. So uh, Professor Kimley uh, has been a global leader in the health the impact of exposure to ultraviolet radiation for over 20 years uh, with uh, more than 220 publications on this topic. So his research really investigates the health, um, the uh, impact on sun exposure and the origin of this disease. So uh, he has been, uh, I mean, even in, in the down under, and so uh, he has been the the sole investigator, and he is funded by NIH R01, a U.S. Department of Defense uh, funding. Uh, even you know, uh, it's, so this is a big challenge for uh, the foreign investigator to uh, be so competitive uh, to the the NIH and DOD grant. So this shows how much of his uh, achievement is. He also has been uh, 15 years of working relationship with NCI, and actually that's a way I. I uh, know him, and so we have a collaboration together with NCI, CDC, and the China CDC together on uh, 
a Chinese uh, intervention study follow up. So all this outcome, uh, you know, has been uh, achieved under under uh, taking his uh, senior academic uh, leadership role, including the executive director for university wide health research institute, director for national center for research excellence, and director for research of Australia's largest public health university department. Um, so he has been uh, held, in, uh, held uh, he has held an appointment in Australia and at the University of Georgia. Um, is currently uh, uh, lead uh, his state of a COVID epidemiology team uh, vaccine uh, rollout coordination in um, um, uh, Australia. So it's a great pleasure and thank you so much. Uh, I cannot say enough, but thank you for willing to give up uh, to share your research with us. No, Professor Kimberly, it's all yours. Oh, thank you very much. Um, Look, it, uh, it is early, um, but it is a, a real pleasure to uh, be able to talk to you. And I think I was talking to Liz before you popped on, and I think, you know, who would imagine, who would imagine even, you know, 18 months ago that, you know, we, we could all be sitting here, you guys eating your lunch and I'm having my early morning coffee, you know, chatting about uh, our shared, shared interest in uh, health impacts and epidemiology. So I think it's a wonderful thing. So... Now the question is, can I actually do the technology and share my, my screen? But we'll see. I'll, I'll, I'll uh, see how that pans out. Okay. Um, I, think, I think that's it. Are we, are we, did that come through? Oh, is that sharing the screen now? Yes. Wonderful. We are in action. Okay. I'm just going to minimise. There we are. So today, um, uh, I wanted to do uh, a tour uh, of where we're at with UV radiation. Um, you know, you, you may cast your mind back uh, for those folks who've been in the business a while, knowing that you know in the early '80s with ozone depletion. UV radiation and skin cancer was a very, very hot topic for a long period of time. And then come the early 2000s, you know, the vitamin D craze kind of hit and it's, and it's still kind of present to a degree. Um, and the role that, that UV radiation has on our health and, and what I'm particularly interested in is our risk of cancer. I think um, there's still a lot of work to do. Um, and it's an extraordinarily complex um, um, area to investigate, particularly around measurements. And this is what I'll spend a bit of time talking about today as well. So we're going to have a bit of a background into UV radiation, uh, the issues around measurement and how we can control for, for errors and bias that, that occur within measurements, and the new area um, that is starting to gain some traction and that is, is there a potential role for ultraviolet radiation and childhood cancer? Okay. So <clears throat> what is uh, UV? That's gonna be part of the talk today. Uh, the beneficial and adverse effects of ultraviolet radiation. And in fact, that, that's a large theme of, of what my work is about is understanding as Joseph said in the introduction, the health duality of, of sunlight exposure. What is really the, the impact of, of both the beneficial um, forms of effects of vitamin, uh, of UV radiation, such as vitamin D? And how do we balance that out against the adverse effects that we know that UVR does occur? Um, UVR and childhood cancer, the challenges of measuring UV exposure. And I'm going to talk about a particular um, example around how we might be able to study childhood cancer in a, in a global uh, cohort consortium. So what is ultraviolet radiation? Well, you can see from this slide here that um, the solar spectrum is, is quite a, a, a large amount of, of radiation coming from the sun. And it consists of ultraviolet, visible and infrared. Um, 
And you can see the breakup there of the actual energy per particular wideband. You can see that 45% of the energy from the sun uh, is infrared. And we feel that as warmth uh, uh, in our skin when we're exposed to the sun. 50% of that energy is from visible light, uh, which is obviously the, the spectrum of, of light from the sun that we see. And it's important for photosynthesis. But only 5% of the incoming solar energy is ultraviolet. And of that particular uh, part of the spectrum, the ultraviolet part of the spectrum, you can see that we can actually break it into two different components, UVC, UVB and UVA. UVB is the particular section of the ultraviolet spectrum that seems to have most of the biological impact that we're going to be talking about today. And it consists of only 0.5% of the total overall spectrum. So it's a very, very small energy component of the incoming solar radiation, but it has significant impacts on our, on our health. And indeed, if we, we look at the, and I apologize for the, the slightly messy and hard to read uh, text there, but if we look at the impacts of various parts of the UV spectrum, um, with UVA, UVB and UVC, UVA actually penetrates quite deep into the dermis. However, the biological effects of UVA are somewhat limited as far as um, cancer formation uh, when compared to UVB. So although it does travel deeper into the dermis, it seems to be involved predominantly with uh, skin aging impact of, of uh, destroying collagen and, and other uh, proteins within the skin. Whereas UVB, uh, it tends to not penetrate as deep um, and it actually is um, the driving factor behind sunburn or erythema in our skin, vitamin D production, and it seems to be responsible for most of the DNA damage that, that is occurring within the skin. UVC, thankfully, thankfully, is absorbed by ozone in the stratosphere. However, occupational exposure to UVC is, is quite prominent in certain workplaces. For example, uh, germicidal UV lamps that are used to sterilize uh, equipment in hospitals contain UVC radiation, and also uh, places that undertake welding, any sort of arc welders or, or, or other type of welding devices where there's a, a high energy uh, light source, it actually produces UVC. And UVC um, is quite a um, highly penetrative and highly DNA damaging uh, part of, of the UV spectrum. So what are the effects of UV radiation of health? Well, you can, there are, as I said in, in the introduction, there's beneficial and, and negative effects. And I thought we'd go over the, the beneficial effects initially. And, and look, the big one and then what, on everyone's lips is the production of vitamin D. And vitamin D, uh, for those who, who don't, uh, aren't keeping up with, with what's, what vitamin D is all about, uh, vitamin D is essentially, um, its main function in the body is calcium homeostasis. So making sure that there's enough bone mineral density, but importantly, muscle strength and muscle function. It's really important for that. So with low vitamin D, um, the body has difficulty in absorbing and then using calcium. The new and less supported evidence um, disease associations with uh, UVR certainly uh, may decrease mortality from some cancers. Uh, seems to decrease blood pressure through the production of uh, nitric oxide in the blood uh, and reduces inflammation potentially through a vitamin D pathway and protects against some autoimmune conditions such as multiple sclerosis. There's definitely a, a strong latitude gradient with multiple sclerosis. Uh, the vitamin D relationship seems to be rolled out, but there seems to be something else in sunlight that seems to be important for multiple sclerosis. While we're on the sub subject of vitamin D, I, I do need just to touch very briefly on, on how vitamin D is formed. Uh, vitamin D is formed through 
um, exposure of the skin to UV radiation, the same UV radiation that, that causes the negative impacts, which I'll talk about in a minute. Um, the sunlight exposure needed to make vitamin D has been quite an area of controversy. Uh, I conducted a study uh, uh, a few years ago, uh, a nationwide study here in Australia to look at what are the determinants of vitamin D in the population and how much sunlight do you really need. And what we found was it's actually minutes of exposure. It's not hours or days of exposure. The skin is extraordinarily efficient at making vitamin D. And you can see here that, that sunlight actually interacts with the skin and hits a cholesterol metabolite, 70-hydrocholesterol. And within the skin, it goes through a thermal reaction to form cholecalciferol, which then goes to the liver, where it's hydroxylized to 25-hydroxy-D. And, and if you see vitamin D papers in the literature, this is the biomarker for vitamin D that, that people use. So you see associations of vitamin D with, it's usually 25-hydroxy-D. But interestingly, 25-hydroxy-D um, is not actually biologically effective. It's biologically inert. It, it is not the active form of vitamin D. The active form of vitamin D occurs when it... Uh, 25-hydroxy-D moves to the kidney, where it gets hydroxylated into 125-dihydroxyvitamin D. And I guess this is a great point to actually say that vitamin D is not a vitamin. And, uh, and it is a secosteroid. So we've been talking for many years and clumping it in the category of vitamin, which... You know, there's a historical impact of it, but uh, the endocrinologists in the room would, would argue that this is a, a very potent secosteroid, which it is. 125-dihydroxyvitamin D is critically important for these factors here, calcium absorption and so on. But in recent years, the evidence to suggest that vitamin D is or as a, as a steroid is far more important. And this, this diagram is a little bit messy, but if we actually look over here to this top right section, um, what we have found is that there are vitamin D nuclear receptors on most um, uh, cell types within the body, but in particular within cancer cells and, and other important um, cellular um, cells within, within the body. And what is important about this nuclear receptor is it can actually make its own 125-dihydroxyvitamin D, the active form. So these cells can independently of the kidney make the hormonal version of vitamin D and it can go through a variety of, of processes then in order to, um, to, to uh, uh, modify health outcomes. So this has certainly changed the game as far as the way we understand vitamin D is used in, in the body and may have implications in what we're going to talk about later on about childhood cancer. So something to think about. Uh, also, uh, to be aware, um, the body is really, really efficient at making vitamin D, but it's also really efficient at destroying vitamin D into these, these compounds that are easily uh, removed from the body. So there's very little, um, uh, from a, a cancer prevention perspective, the skin, you only need minutes of exposure to make vitamin D. Uh, but also the more exposure you get, the actual greater the chance for vitamin D to actually be destroyed into these inert compounds and removed from the body. So there's no point sunbaking for vitamin D. That's what I'm trying to say. Uh, vitamin D is also found in, in foods. Um, it's found in oily fish, salmon, mackerel, um, eggs and meat have a small amount. And as you know, you know, going to the, the dairy section of the supermarket, uh, there's a lot of milk and dairy products that are fortified with vitamin D. And there's also over-the-counter supplements for vitamin D, but, but dietary intake is small and sporadic. So vitamin D seems to be one of the, the biggest um, negative impacts of, of, of exposure, I mean, positive impacts of, of sunlight exposure. As far as the negative impacts, as I said, you know, there's, there's a whole uh, body of research showing that uh, a vitamin D, is, uh, sorry, UV is associated with uh, skin aging. And I spoke before about UVA being, being the primary driver. 
uh, sunburn, uh, weakening the immune system. So looking at immune fun function being suppressed after overexposure to UV. So there seems to be a balance between some stimulation of immune system function by small amounts of UV, but once you receive a reasonably high dose of UV, it actually reduces immune function. Uh, it causes uh, mutational changes into skin DNA, particularly for keratinocytes and also uh, melanocytes, leading to melanoma and keratinocyte cancers, uh, leading to eye conditions such as inflammation, cataracts and drigia. Uh, and some work that we have done uh, recently is looking at the impact of, of UVR exposure on folate. And we found that when we looked at uh, about 150 um, um, women who are of childbearing age, those who had the highest sun exposure uh, patterns and highest sun exposure, uh, and we measure that via dissymmetry, they actually had the lowest levels of red cell and uh, serum folate. So there seems to be a relationship between folate and sun exposure as well. But how does UVR actually impact on, on cancer risk? Well, you know, uh, I've mentioned previously that there's direct DNA damage and that, that certainly does depend on the wavelength of light and where it actually penetrates in the skin, but there can be certainly direct DNA damage. Uh, production of nitrous oxide to actually send off signaling pathways. Uh, the modulation of UV mediated immune pathways, regulation of cytokines, and um, it, it certainly, uh, something to remind ourselves that that UV radiation has actually been designated by IARC as a, a class one carcinogen and, and it certainly is um, well established that UV exposure increases risk of cancers of the skin and eye. But how, when we're talking about childhood cancer, could possibly something that happens on the skin impact something inside? Uh, so Sun exposure has a range of effects, and I just wanted to kind of go over them before we move on. Um, certainly, um, we've talked about vitamin D very briefly. I could speak for, for days on vitamin D, but uh, it's involved in vitamin D production and also vitamin D destruction. So uh, excessive sunlight exposure does not produce more, more UV. It actually produce uh, more vitamin D, it actually produces less vitamin D because it's, it destroys the vitamin D that produced. Uh, sun exposure seems to be associated with folate destruction and reduce folate levels in women of childbearing age. It certainly uh, is associated with erythema or sunburn uh, in, in individuals, which increases risk of skin cancers. Uh, sun exposure certainly does increase risk of uh, basal cell carcinoma, squamous cell carcinoma, and melanoma. And if we look at those particular cancers uh, as a whole, the, those in Australia actually are, are the top, top cancers in all of Australia by a significant margin. Um, the, that is a huge burden on our, on our healthcare system in Australia. And then finally, we know that sun exposure, excessive sun exposure is, is really critical for immune suppression. And I'll just move on from this. Um, so when we think about um, sunlight and cancer, um, I, I think it's always good to look back before we go forward. And, and I think this, this, this particular graph, I love showing my students because I, it's a, it's a wonderful um, early representation of, of data from the US <clears throat> looking at um, cancer mortality per 100,000 of the population. And this particular example is for the white population as a function of solar radiation index. And, and I'll get you to note the, the date of publication is 1941. And you can see that the increased mortality seems to occur at these um, higher latitude locations. And these sunnier, more southern locations seem to have a lower um, risk of, of mortality. Now, to a certain extent, this particular graph still holds true today, where there is a latitude gradient with respect to uh, cancer mortality. And we're not quite sure 
what's driving that. But I think this is a really good example in, of where the field may have started. And this work by Appley in 1941 certainly did raise the question of, does sunlight have an effect on our cancer risk beyond that of, of cancers of the skin? And if we, we, we extend that question further, here's some preliminary data that uh, I've collected from uh, our study that we conducted for the uh, US Department of Defense, where we looked at the relationship between uh, melanoma thickness, and we know that the thickness of a melanoma really does give you a good uh, trajectory on survival uh, and risk of survival of and risk of second, second primary uh, melanomas as well. And this is plotted as a function of serum vitamin D. And you can see that those with higher vitamin D um, tend to have thinner melanomas. And that's a really interesting finding. This is vitamin D involved in, in the biological pathway for melanoma. Yes, it is. Is there a direct association or, or causality of this? Not sure, but certainly there is an association between those with higher levels of vitamin D at diagnosis and thickness of tumour. Now, this is only 62. Uh, in the past month or so, we've got the full cohort of about 270 patients, and this graph holds true. So I haven't put that data up. We're still analysing it, but preliminary analysis certainly does show that the shape of this particular relationship holds true when we extend it to a larger number of people with thicker melanomas and also more thinner melanomas in that cohort. So <clears throat> where do we sit with UV and childhood cancer? Well, childhood cancer... Um, although it's a, the second most common cause of mortality in, in childhood, it is a rare disease. And so being a rare disease, it's actually very difficult to obtain quality data because it's so uncommon. Um, and importantly, when we're talking about childhood cancers, these are distinct diseases that may have very, very different causes and mechanisms and, as you know, therapeutic approaches that cannot be extrapolated from adult malignancy. So when we're thinking about childhood cancer, the mechanisms at play may or may not correlate with what's going on with adult cancer. So this is, a, this is certainly a, a confronting issue that you need to constantly remind yourself that these cancers are, are certainly being driven potentially by different factors than we know and expect uh, within adult cancers. So there's been a little bit of work and, and what I'm going to do is summarize what's been, been going on um, relating to um, sunlight exposure, UVR exposure in cancer. So there's certainly some evidence to suggest that, and I showed you some work previously, but uh, the lower risk of some adult cancers, um, in particular, uh, the, some leukemias uh, and NHL, there seems to be a lower risk and a significant lower risk um, for people living in high solar UVR locations. So this is merely location of residence and adult cancers. Um, there seems to be, a, when compared to lower so, solar UV radiations, a reduced risk of those particular cancers. However, for children, it, it, there's no, and you'll see in the slides going forward, there seems to be uh, conflicting evidence where there's some increase and some decrease in risk. And for this particular um, example, there's an increased risk of intracranial, interspinal uh, embryonic style tumours was a, a significant increase in risk. But this particular study, what it showed is there's actually a protective effect when we started looking at the season of birth for those births occurring from April to September, indicating that 
potentially it's not time of diagnosis or year of, of diagnosis or annual sunlight exposure or residential sunlight exposure that's important. It might actually indicate that there's particular risk periods that we need to look at for childhood cancer. So pot potentially through pregnancy or early life or even uh, pre-pregnancy periods that could be critically important in the etiology in this particular case of, of ALL uh, leukemia. And if we look at this, this other study where it was an ecological study where they looked at a childhood cancer registry and two population-based uh, surrogates of sunlight exposure, that is one, the latitude of the registry city and two, the annual solar radiation. Um, they found that annual solar radiation was significantly associated with cancer incidence and the direction was consistent between the uh, surrogates. However, findings weren't consistent across the tumor types. And you can see that in this particular data that there's a reduced risk um, of all cancers combined, you see of 0.95, uh, like a 5% reduction. So the results are not consistent around what this is, potentially indicating some measurement error that is occurring. Uh, because again, the proxies that they're using for sunlight exposure, are they actually sufficient to look at it at an individual level? And another study looking at um, higher residential UV exposure in childhood <laughs> increases the risk of pediatric melanoma. This is an extraordinarily rare disease, pediatric melanoma. Um, there's probably less than uh, 50 cases here in Australia a year. Um, but you can see the increased risk is quite actually uh, significant for spring relative to fall birth. Uh, and it's got to do with perinatal exposure. Um, certainly um, with um, uh, precursor B cell ALL, um, there's an increased risk uh, for low UV exposure compared to high UV exposure. Again, prenatal exposure it seems to be critical for UVR. Uh, decrease in risk of several cancers, including ALL, in children aged 0 to 14 uh, in a multi-country ecological study. And again, their measures of sunlight were related to residential uh, exposure. So they didn't look at individual exposure patterns over their lifetime. It was merely if you lived in Toronto, this was your um, UV score that you were given. Um, and there was a decreased risk of developing ALL, uh, NHL, an increased risk of intracranial interspinal embryonic tumours. Um, and that's from the California Cancer Registry. So there's evidence to suggest that UV exposure might be critical in childhood cancer. However, we've got questions around measurement error. We've got some potential conflicting results around increase and decrease risk. And also we've got questions around when the timing of exposure could be, could be critical for this particular work. Um, so it may suggest that initiation of these cancers may occur in neutro as well as postnatally. And again, as I said, leading into childhood cancer section of this talk, Childhood cancer is a rare disease. So data is, is hard to come by, hard to assess. And so th this particular hypothesis is one that we certainly we, we need to assess. So the questions then, then arise, at what stage in childhood is UVR, UV exposure important? Should we be looking at UV exposure before, during or after pregnancy? And what other factors may be correlated with UV exposure? And if we go back to those slides that I put at the beginning of today's talk, looking at the, the beneficial and, and harmful impacts of, of UV exposure, there's a whole range of factors, folate, vitamin D, immune suppression, that could be involved with this. And it's actually quite a complex question. Combined with this, we need to talk about measurement error. And there are significant challenges of measuring population UV exposure. So, it's difficult to measure extended UV exposure relative to diseases such as cancer, even childhood cancer, due to the large lead time of the development of the disease. So epi research into, into UV induced disease 
typically rely on retrospective self-reported time outdoors. Difficult to get in a childhood cohort, but is possible. Um, static ecological type variables such as latitude of residence, and you've seen with the results so far that I've presented that there seems to be something to do with uh, location of residence um, that could be uh, important. And also UV index, and, and UV index is a measure of sunlight intensity, is actually a measure for long-term personal UVR. So again, getting back to the situation of, well, you live in a, in a southern location, you've got a high UV exposure all year round. Well, is that really the case when we take into, into account people's behaviours in the sun? So when we think of this, uh, we've only got poor to fair reproducibility and untested validity uh, leading to these measurement areas, which I think could be a, a concern when we're talking about these childhood cancers and UV. When we're thinking about the, the errors that might occur, there's a large range of determinants um, that are impacted um, in personal solar ultraviolet radiation exposure. Obviously, location of residence is critical. So where you live, the season that you're in, the altitude, the higher up in, in the atmosphere, if you live in the mountains, you have a slightly higher exposure than if you live at sea level. Uh, ozone, air pollution, cloud covers, um, angle of the sun, reflection, whether you live near water where there's a high amount of UV uh, reflected from the surface and snow. Uh, these, these are environmental factors. But also, that aside, there's behavioural factors. So people spending time outdoors. So if we're talking about windows of exposure that could be critical, what about someone, and if we're saying that pregnancy may be important for childhood cancers, what about time outdoors? You know, um, what time outdoors do people pre-pregnancy and during pregnancy spend outdoors? How much skin is exposed? How much clothing is used? What sort of sun protection is used? And then combined with that, again, we've got the personal phenotypes. So those who have a propensity for burning, such as uh, fair uh, skin and red hair, uh, may actually be sun avoiders more than people who, who tan easily. Uh, skin cancer health history, uh, medications such as photosensitizers, some antibiotics, sun exposure knowledge, attitudes and behaviours. So thinking about these, these factors, there's a large amount of measurement error that can actually occur. So yeah. wow. in the absence of measures of, of um, you know, long-term individual sun exposure history, we might be able to measure um, using uh, more passive ways, long-term personal UV exposure. So we can do uh, long-term UV exposure through a variety of measure, measures. And um, some of the work that, that we've been doing in, in my lab and certainly the work that Joseph and I've been involved with uh, is dissimetry. And, and I have a, um, my relationship with uh, uh, NCI is certainly around the dissimetry side of things where, where I actually make a, a UV measurement dissimeter made from polysulfone, which is a polymer that, that degrades in sunlight uh, and it mimics this, the, the way that skin uh, is, uh, is impacted in sunlight. Um, so dissimetry is certainly the gold standard of measuring sun exposure on an individual level, but that can be also supplemented and combined with a diary for time outdoors and a questionnaire. But these are really um, quite a burdensome and expensive way to go and sometimes difficult to do in large studies. Um, there are some new electronic dissimilars and you may have seen these on the market in particular, marketed by, by some certain health companies that uh, with wearable devices that you can measure um, your UV exposure. And, and those particular devices although are great to give you a guide. Uh, as far as projects such as this, where we need to know whether sun exposure is associated with, in this case particular, uh, childhood cancers, there are large inaccuracies with these particular electronic dissimeters. So we tend to focus on our, our polysulfone dissimeters rather than electronic dissimeters. Uh, there's certainly uh, measurement errors, you know, recall, uh, social de desirability bias, and it's very difficult and expensive for large population and cohort studies already underway.
we mentioned before about the challenges of, of measuring UV um, through indirect measures such as latitude or a postcode of residence. Uh, you can average ambient UV radiation. Um, and the issue with these particular measures is that population groups are not homogeneous with regards to their sun exposure. The sun exposure that you receive compared to what I receive certainly does depend on all of those factors I mentioned before around location of residence, uh, available UV, your perception of your, your, yourself in the sun, your history of skin cancer, all these factors actually relate to um, your, your sun exposure. And that can produce a large area if we think about using latitude postcode of residence as a measure. So, um, Satellite and ground-based assessments don't account for behavioural, cultural and phenotypic differences in populations that significantly impact UV exposure. So, so what, what can we actually do? Well, there is satellite data available and there is a, an instrument called TOMS, the Total Ozone Mapping Spectrometer, which is uh, operated by NASA that estimates UVR taking into account time of year, elevation, cloud cover at a particular location. But what's neat about this data is that it can be merged with local temperature and rainfall and humidity data, uh, linked with characteristics of individuals. So if we know the population that we're, we're examining, we can tie, tie in uh, issues around skin, hair, eye color, burning, tanning, to predict personal UV exposure. And we develop models to actually do that. And it can be linked with residential address because what is really neat about Tom's data is that it provides global coverage on a daily level of UV exposure. So that means we can compare groups on a daily level throughout the world. We're, certainly we need to take into consideration these individual characteristics, but it gives us unprecedented access to what is happening at a environmental level uh, as far as, as UV exposure and potentially combining it with our, our model to incorporate the characteristics of the individuals. So there's also um, another method that we've been working on at the NCI, and that is refining that measurement to say, okay, we've got global coverage with the TOMS NASA satellite data, which could be of use. There's actually more fine-grained data that we can look at with daily variability in, in sunlight exposure or UV exposure. And it's a, a, a finer grain pixel. So the what I mean by that is the TOMS data provides a snapshot of UV in a 125 by 125 kilometer square grid which is quite a large, what is that? Is that 60 miles or so? I'm not sure, anyway, I'm a metric man, sorry. Um, so I think it's about 50, 60 miles. So it, it's quite a large grid size as far as uh, the size of the data. Whereas ground measurements can actually improve that, that spatial resolution that we might actually need. And we've been working with um, um, folks at NCI to actually develop a technique and we, we've just recently published it where we've looked at um, uh, ground-based measurements and they're really um, quite a substantial step up in improvement of measuring sun exposure using these ground-based measurements. I mentioned previously that a challenge in, in this area is looking at how human behavior impacts UV exposure. And if we're thinking about certain windows of, of exposure that are important for, for childhood cancer risk, we need to understand those behavior patterns and its impact on UV exposure. This is a particular study that I did um, with a colleague of mine from the University of Georgia. And um, Alan Stewart and I, um, Alan is a um, health psychologist where he is really interested in how people react to weather events. So a lot of his work is looking at um, people responding to extreme weather events and their psychological impact. What he did is, is, is we took those tools that he used for those extreme events, but actually put it to sun exposure. And what we, have, what we did is 
we were able to recruit about 1,400 people from Georgia. Um, and through a, a questionnaire that he developed and validated, he could put people into groups of people who dislike heat and people who like heat. Heat, not sunlight, but heat. So you know those people. You might be one of those people who hates winter, cannot wait for summer. As soon as the, the heat arrives, you're out playing golf or playing tennis out in the, in the sunlight. Um, compared with people who dislike heat, I, I really don't like the hot weather. I try and avoid it. I need to get in the air conditioning. It makes me feel yucky. So they're the heat dislike and like people. And if you look at the way that people like and dislike heat as a function of their time um, uh, during the year that they enjoy being outside or not, you can see that there are differences and you can see that the heat liking people down the bottom graph, they, they certainly uh, try and spend time indoors during uh, winter time of the colder months and then oops, as soon as the, the weather and the temperature increases that they, they are outdoors. Yet those who are um, uh, heat dislike people actually have a, um, a change in pattern of exposure um, in the shoulder months, these fall and spring months. And this graph is not quite visible enough, but this one really does show it quite nicely. So these are the proportion of respondents who would go outside with no sun protection as a function <coughs> of month of year. And you can see that this is a bit of a problem. Because if we assume that we've got a homogeneous population who live in the South, who get a high sun exposure, you can see that on an individual level, those who liked hot conditions in January didn't really go outdoors as much as those who enjoyed the cooler conditions, okay, who disliked the, the hot conditions. You can see that this change of exposure and the change of uh, of some protection use. Yet as the summer months in, uh, in, in, uh, increased, you can see that the use of some protection increased and they almost mimic each other. Yet again, we have this variation between uh, use of some protection and time outdoors uh, in, the, uh, in the fall months as well. So this is actually a problem when we're starting to look at, at, at can we use these broad measures in this rare disease uh, such as childhood cancer. Can we use these broad measures of, of satellite and ground-based data to measure sun exposure? It's a real challenge. So living in a sunny climate doesn't necessarily translate into high personal UV exposure. And we validated that particular study here in Australia where we looked at people's sun exposure in a, in a latitude very similar to Cuba. Um, Cuba's latitude in the Northern Hemisphere, we've got a similar latitude here in Australia. And people tend to spend the higher UV summer months indoors because of the, of the weather. Um, moderate to low environmental UV can result in high UV exposure due to behaviours. And temperature appears to drive a lot of the outdoor activities uh, amongst people. So this heat, like and dislike seems to be a large driver of what's going on. And we need to investigate this all in particular around this risk of childhood cancer and potentially other cancers as well. So I'm conscious it's almost the end of your um, lunch break. So next step. Um, so where are we going with this? Well, there's a, um, an international cohort called the I4C, the International Childhood Cancer Cohort, where all of the um, childhood cohort cancer uh, groups are pooling the data, which is really significant because we have a large amount of data available. So I'm working with those groups. There's huge opportunities for data linkage because it's not just cancer data. There's also tumor and biobank data available. Um, and there, there's a huge amount of possibilities with this particular cohort. So we might be able to start answering the question around whether solar UV radiation is involved in childhood cancers. And so we've got a great investigator team here, uh, people from Oxford and, and NCI. Um, and our main objective is to investigate the relationship between solar UVR 
and incidence of childhood cancers to really look at if we pull all the data together, we have standardized measures, is there a relationship? Because at the moment we've got a, a large amount of ad hoc radio, um, information and as far as is UV involved in childhood cancers and hopefully this ecological study can actually start to answer that question that we can then dive into further research questions if there is an outcome to see where the mechanisms may be. So one final comment. Um, T5 mutation. I, I need to talk a little bit about this. In the melanoma world, which I live in as well, T5 is a, a group of UV-induced mutations that are clumped together that are signature in all melanomas. Um, they're also present in, in some keratinocyte skin cancers as well, but, but mainly melanomas. And it is certainly universally known as a, a UV-induced mutation. Just recently, about three years ago, um, there was a study in Nature finding in ALL patients, pediatric ALL patients, they actually found in tumours T5 exposure signature. Um, the question is, how does a, a signature mutation that occurs in the skin through sunlight exposure end up in bone marrow? That is the real question. Um, but this particular study in nature was only found in eight of the 689 samples that they looked at, so 1.2%. Um, and the ages of these children, and they're all Caucasian children, they were quite young, three, 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 four, 11 and 14. But nevertheless, this, this particular question around how, uh, can I say, a melanoma signature group of mutations, this T5 mutation, how could that even be reported in, in a prestigious journal uh, as something that's real, um, how could that happen? What, what, is, what is going on? So I reached out to a colleague of mine, Deb White, from uh, the University of Adelaide, who runs Australia's um, ALL uh, Biobank and Registry. Uh, and what we did is we tested if this uh, signature mutation was present in our Australian samples. And the expectation was that this would be more prevalent in our population due to high solar UV levels. In Australia, we are, you know, our, our wintertime uh, UV levels here in Brisbane exceed your summertime UV levels in Alabama. So it, um, you're not in Alabama, sorry. Uh, your summertime uh, UV levels in Southern America. So it's, it's actually extremely high levels of UV levels uh, of UV radiation. So we looked at uh, the AYA population, so adolescents and young, young adult patients, which were slightly older uh, and they would have had greater sunlight exposure. So we would actually expect to see that mutation more in that particular group if it was related to sun exposure. Um, and there's our results on the right. We found in all 178 samples, the T5 in UV induced mutation in these ALL patients. So now we're sitting back going, what the heck does this mean? Uh, we've, we've conducted further analysis to look at the size of the mutation, this T5 mutation um, with older patients. And certainly it, it increases with AIDS. There seems to be a dose response. Uh, but uh, the younger patients were yet to actually run that data on. So this is a, a really interesting finding, I guess, suggesting that UV could have some role. We know that, that, that childhood cancer is a, is, is a etiologically um, you know, uh, complex disease. This may be a part. We're not sure. There's more to follow. So finishing up. Uh, the role of childhood uh, UV exposure on childhood cancer risk is a really under-researched area and it's a rare disease. There is some evidence to suggest there may be a role to play for UV, 
However, the complexity around the multiple pathways, vitamin D, UV immune modulation, folate, needs to be assessed to define the impact these may have on an individual level. There's also our opportunities and experience from UV from uh, UV research and adult cancers to apply this to this research question, but there is a lot of work to do. Thank you very much, and I will stop talking and have a sip of coffee. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. I think, Dr. Sue, we have a little time for questions. Yeah, it's open for questions. Yeah, but uh, I, I want to have a question first. So, uh, so there seems to have uh, some uh, conflicting uh, finding between vitamin D or versus uh, UV radiation. And so um, my question is, like uh, my uh, primary care doctor keep telling me that you need to take a supplement, you need to take a supplement. Is a supplement really is the answer? Um, from a cancer prevention point of view, uh, and I'll put my skin cancer prevention hat on, certainly avoiding sun exposure um, in order to, to make vitamin D through the taking of the supplement is, is a wise idea. The amount that we require as far as an oral supplement is, you know, it depends on the literature that you read. Certainly the Office of Dietary Supplements and, the, and our colleague Nancy uh, Porsherman uh, are there. The, the, the official line is, is 1,000 international units per day maximum. And that seems to be, be sufficient. But the, the oral pathway of vitamin D is, it, the body recognises it the same way as, as vitamin D produced in the skin. Uh, the issues occur around if there are some other comorbidities that may impact the gastric absorption of vitamin D, uh, which may lead to people taking vitamin D and not actually getting sufficient dose. The question around vitamin D and disease is one that I think is, is far from over, uh, but certainly um, it, it, the bone health relationship is strong and something that we should certainly be aware of, that osteoporosis muscle, muscle function. And for that, you just need a, a sufficient level of vitamin D with, with a small oral supplement each day should be sufficient. Right, thank you. Um, so this is Wendy Nemhard, and thank you so much for a really fantastic presentation. Um, I have a question in terms of um, effect modification by race and ethnicity. Mm -hmm. So I know in, uh, in Australia, you have Aboriginals, which mm -hmm. are not the equivalent of African Americans in the United no. States. But no. since you've done a lot of work in other countries, um, do you find that um, the, the role of, of vitamin D and the risk of skin cancer and all of these uh, various factors that you've described, folic acid and so forth, have you mm -hmm. seen variation by race and ethnicity and uh, in terms of skin cancer risk? Well, look, you know, th there's the vitamin D paradox with African-American populations where um, the paradox is that um, most African-American folk have a lower uh, level of, of vitamin D than the, the population mean, yet their bone health is fantastic. If we look at their... Their, their, their risk of femoral neck fractures, it's, it's actually a little, little bit lower. Um, but the, the risk of skin cancer, certainly um, with respect to skin type, is a consideration that I think really does drive a lot of behaviours. And, and certainly the work that we did at UGA, where we looked at the, the heat perceptions, I did ask Alan, and we included in the questionnaire, to look at uh, individuals' responses um, as a function of self-reported ethnicity and risk of skin cancer. And certainly those with darker skin tones uh, self-reported that their, their perception of skin cancer risk was uh, very, very low, if not nil, compared with those who had a lighter skin tone who reported a higher risk. I think that the, the balance between the population health messaging in a, in, a, in a ethnically mixed population is quite difficult because the messages are not similar for all. If we promote some protection to all, 
and everyone needs to wear sunscreen all the time outdoors. And you 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 mention that to a person with a Fitzpatrick type five skin, you know the the uh, extraordinarily um, highly pigmented skin. It just doesn't make sense as far as risk of skin cancer. So I think. The challenge, and I've been working with folks at the CDC from the National Skin Cancer Committee, is actually trying to look at um, racially and ethnically appropriate messages that can target at-risk populations for skin cancer. Because, um, you know, Joseph and I have been talking a lot recently about what the heck is going on in the southern states of the US? Why is melanoma, particularly in men aged 40 to 55, skyrocketing? And I think that's driven primarily through Caucasian population, but it'd be really interesting to see uh, risk of, of other populations and how that's changing as well, because um, we, we've got a study that we're conducting at the moment in Sydney, where we're looking at, at various skin tones and, and these, these issues around risk perception of melanoma. And what we're finding when we actually look at the genetic makeup of these individuals, of those with the darker skin tones, around about a quarter to a third of the population actually have the melanoma risk genes turned on, the MCR1 genes turned on. So these people, although they uh, tan or they don't tan or they tan minimally, they've got quite dark skin, they still actually have the melanoma risk gene activated and they're being impacted through sun exposure. So Wendy, that's an extraordinarily complex question. I gave you a very roundabout answer, but I think it kind of highlights the fact that I think it's a, a real open area that, that we need to attract our attention to. This is, thank you. <laughs> this is uh, Carol Cornell. I uh, actually uh, have a question about the germicidal UV lights. I mm -hmm. saw those a fair amount early uh, in the pandemic here last spring in offices and various other places. And I was wondering if much work has been done with that and exposure to that. No, no, that's, that's an excellent question. And we've seen that too here in Australia and, you know, the, the, uh, and now that the, you know, the airborne nature of, of, of COVID seems to be um, a, a, a highly, uh, supported hypothesis. Um, people are thinking about using these germicidal lamps. Now, there's two issues with that. One, they produce UVC. And as soon as you say UVC to a, uh, a melanoma researcher, uh, we start to faint and our eyes cross and, you know, it, it, it becomes, it, it, it's quite a high exposure. So a small exposure time can lead to a high dose. That's number one. Number two, when you... Um, create, when you produce UVC, whenever UVC interacts with an oxygen molecule, you actually split an oxygen, it's got enough energy to split an oxygen into you know, two sing, oxygen singlets, and they produce ozone. They go find an O2 molecule, and then it makes ozone. Now, ozone, we know up top, up in the stratosphere, it's great to pre prevent UV, but down in, a, in someone's home or down in a, in a lab or down in someone's surgery, um, ozone is actually a known risk factor for uh, lung and other disorders. So um, this is a issue that I think a good simple measurement program uh, with risk mitigation strategies produced would be a wonderful project. Great, thanks. All right. Quick question. You alluded earlier, and great talk, by the way, fantastic. Thank you. You alluded to the hormetic effects of UV radiation, especially higher level ionizing uh, mm -hmm. UV radiation. Um, could that in part explain that um, relationship you observe uh, as reg that, that latitudinal uh, relationship and lower risk more narrowly and then more broadly, a number of researchers, T.D. Lucky and, and others, have uh, worked on this for a number of years. And I, I'd be interested in your thoughts regarding the fact that there is you know, a hormetic effect and that um, some exposure is required for uh, optimal uh, life. 
Yeah, well, look, I think that's a true, and thanks, thanks for that question, thanks for the feedback. You know, I, I agree. You know, this is this is where I've absolutely positioned my work is looking at the fact, you know, the health duality of sun exposure. Some people accuse me for sitting on the fence and getting splinters in my bottom because I'm not, not taking a side. But I, I agree with you. You can't take a side because we as a species have evolved to actually be outdoors. Um, not all the time, uh, but we have evolved. And, and a, a great example of that is, is um, obviously vitamin D. Obviously, also the fact that our eyes produce hormone, you know, looking at the, the melatonin, serotonin relationship uh, through sun, sun exposure in our eyes. And then all of these other pathways that I just don't think we're fully on top of. In particular, the one that I think that, that could really, you know, have traction is this immune response. Um, and the fact that, um, you know, what is that balance between what is enough exposure to stimulate immune function, both locally in the skin and systemically, versus overexposure, where we know that you can get chronic um, immune suppression through excessive sun exposure, balanced with, we know that, you know, vitamin D, um, the, the number one prescribed worldwide uh, topical cream for um, psoriasis is a vitamin D analog. <laughs> um, so we know it's anti-inflammatory. So you've got vitamin D tapped in on this as well. So look, I completely agree with you that we have evolved to be in the sun. The mechanisms, I think, I'm a little bit concerned as a uh, as someone in the field, I'm concerned that it's all de rigueur. People believe that the, 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 you know, we've solved the vitamin D issue, we've solved the, 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 the UV issue and, and melanoma and skin cancer. Let's move on to the next issue. To a great degree we have, but I think the question that you raised is really the, the nub of the issue. Where do we fit in the way that we have changed our patterns of lifestyle Look at us all now, we're all sitting inside and, you know, we're not outdoors, you know, we've changed the way that we live and how does that impact our disease risk both now and in the future and perhaps intergenerationally? Um, and I think, I think there's some really big questions that, that I think need to be answered. But as Joseph, he's, he's got a very good listening ear and whenever I get the bad NIH reviews, I always ring him up and have a one or two hour um, session complaining about, you know, the, the lack of empathy and understanding. So I think there's a unique opportunity to build a coalition of the willing to really find out what is this question. And I, and I think it's, it's more than one thing. And that's, that's the complexity. We've picked all the low hanging fruit. Mm. Thank you. We have, we have one more question from Ari. Ari, you want to uh, ask your question yourself? Hi, yes, thanks. Thanks, Dr. Kimlin, for a wonderful presentation. Uh, I was inquiring, uh, based upon Dr. Cornell's question about the UV light for uh, the COVID exposure. So I worked in local health units back in Kansas City, and we had TB clinic mm -hmm. on site. And so we use UV light all the time in the clinic because active cases are coming through. So have you all seen any uh, research or studies indicating that since you're saying UV light increases UVC exposure, that there's mm -hmm. been increased number of uh, skin cancer cases among uh, healthcare workers in those kinds of settings? No, no, I haven't seen any data myself, nor have I seen any information in the literature. Uh, and I guess that this could be a classification, you know, exposure classification issue that, you know, although there might be melanoma and other skin cancers that are recorded on a registry, the occupational exposure uh, may not have been recorded appropriately. And I think, you know, thinking about these particular exposure sites, you know, this is something that perhaps wouldn't have come across the radar. And, and so, no, I haven't seen any. Um, but uh, if there was certainly chronic exposure, it would be something that I would be interested in, in looking at following up. And, and I think that that would certainly be an interesting case study for sure. Thanks so much. Great. 
Well, this has been a fabulous talk. Um, Joseph, thank you for your long-term friendship with Dr. Kimlin. And uh, Dr. Kimlin, thank you so much for a, a wonderful presentation. You got people to stay on after, after, after lunch, so congratulations. Well, there you go. You know, obviously the check's cleared, cleared so that's great. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. Look, thanks, thanks for the opportunity. It's great to chat and, um, you know, I appreciate it. And look, uh, I think there's a, a certainly, the, there's certainly interest here. And if anyone's interested in, in having chats offline, please feel free. Joseph's got my email and we can, we can go from there. Right. Fabulous. Thank you. Thank you very much. Take care. Thanks, everyone. Have a great day. Hey? Bye. Bye.